seats will begin. I'll ask you at this time to please extinguish yourself. <laughs> Temporarily. <laughs> this is going to be recorded, so that's why. You can appear to the no cell phone. Welcome to the University of Maine School of Law, particularly those of you who haven't been here before. We hope you will come back. My name is Charles Norkey. I am professor of law here and director of our Center for Oceans and Coastal Law. And the Center for Oceans and Coastal Law is engaged in a wide range of research activities, both coastal and oceans, involving institutions here in Maine, the Northeast United States, Canada, Europe, and East Asia. We also support and publish the Oceans and Coastal Law Journal, whose editors are here in the back of the room and probably scattered about, uh, one of the premier journals in the field. I also want to extend a special appreciation to our co-sponsor, Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve. And the director of Wells Reserve, Paul, is here. This uh, is the first of what we hope will be a series of collaborations with Wells Reserve, along with our other collaborating partners. And so we're particularly delighted to return to a subject which we have been involved with years ago before I came here, and which two members of our panel have been involved in here at the law school. And with that, allow me to introduce our panelists. Orlando Delagu is emeritus professor of law, though I don't think of him as emeritus, particularly when I see him lecture to students today, as he did in my class yesterday. Uh, Orlando has taught and conducted research at this law school for 40 years and counting, has a long record of public service and engagement in land use, property, environmental law, and public policy. I'm pleased to welcome back, I'd like to say welcome back home, Professor John Duff. Professor Duff is Associate Professor of Environment Law and Policy at the University of Massachusetts Boston School of the Environment. John has an extensive career over the past 25 years. He has worked as a newspaper reporter, an attorney in private practice. He served as general counsel to nonprofit. He's focused on marine habitat protection issues, and he directed the Marine Law Research Program at the University of Maine School of Law and this law school in his previous incarnation. And John will moderate this evening. We have with us Tim Glidden, who has been a participant in Maine's conservation scene for the past 40 years. She doesn't seem like 40 years. In 2011, he became president of Maine's Coast Heritage Trust. Previous to that, Mr. Glidden led the land for Maine's future program during a period of unprecedented success in state land conservation. Gerwig Parkinson is here, attorney with the Kennebunk based law firm of Bergen and Parkinson. She has argued over 20 cases before the Marines, the main rather Supreme Judicial Court, including the Wells Beach case. She was also involved in attempting to identify common ground between public use and private ownership of Goose Rocks Beach in Kennebunk Court as a court appointed mediator. Amy Chow is here with us. Amy is an attorney with Drummond Woodsman here in Portland, her practice area, among other things, involves <laughs> municipal law, land use, conservation, and education law. Ms. Chow was legal counsel to Kennebunk Court, presented the oral argument before the Maine Supreme Judicial Court in the Goose Rock speech case. Pete Thaxter, Sidney Pete Thaxter is here. He's one of the founding partners of the Curtis Thaxter Law Firm here in Portland. Very extensive career as a notable practitioner. Among his notable presentations have been cases involving Maine's beachfront property rights, including Bells versus the town of Wells, Commodore et al. versus the town of Canton Court. With that, I'm going to stop and hand the floor to our moderator. <laughs> Thank you, and let me first say that I'm always thrilled to come back to Maine. Uh, I spent a very important part of my working life here, uh, but in fact, whenever I come back to Maine, I, I feel compelled to explain 
Um, I do have a bloodline sort of Maine as well. My grandfather was born and raised on a farm in Gardner, Maine, um, and he was one of the generations that, that lived here. Um, it doesn't, doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but he moved to Massachusetts, and that's been the, the demise of the family history ever since. Um, so then I, rem I, I remind you, well, Maine is somewhat like me. We used to be family, right? So Maine used to be part of Massachusetts, and then it left. Uh, so we just went in different directions. So it's always a, it's always a thrill to be back here. Um, not only did I enjoy working here, I made some very good friends uh, among my colleagues here. I met my wife here. We bought our first home here. Uh, so there are a whole host of things about Maine uh, that made me feel like I'm coming back home. And I, I do hope to come back uh, time again. This evening, uh, we will be continuing a discussion that started a few months ago with a series of panels sponsored, uh, co-sponsored by the Wells Reserve, as long, uh, along with Maine Sea Grant, who's been involved in sponsoring these kinds of talks for quite some time. Tonight's discussion is about uh, one subset or one element of this larger discussion of whether and how folks have access to the coast of Maine. Tonight's discussion will focus on uh, something, the colonial ordinance, that I suspect many folks here are familiar with, and if I use the term fishing, filing, and navigation, I'm wondering how many folks here are familiar with this term. Yes, that's not surprising. This is one of the few places in the United States where you can utter a term uh, that, that elaborates a, a jurisprudential concept and, and the entire public knows what it means. So we've got two folks who will be talking about what that means. What does fishing, filing, and navigation mean? Uh, is it an exclusive list of interests that the public has in certain areas of the main coastline? Or is it exemplary? Is it just a subset of what might be a, an evolving set of them? And even if it is a limited uh, set of interests, do those limited itemized uh, interests have room for dynamism or expansion? And, and the reason I raise that is uh, there was a case a few years ago here in Maine where it's one of the few times where I've seen a unanimous decision actually uh, turn out to be a tie. There was a 6-0 decision by the Maine Law Court indicating that a group of scuba divers had a right of uh, access over an intertidal land, a piece of private property owned by someone else, um, and they all agreed that in fact scuba divers should have a right of access. All seven <coughs> justices ruling ruled on it, but they split three and three. Three of the justices indicated uh, that scuba diving was not a form of navigation, but was one of a set of greater set of rights that ought to be afforded to the public in the intertidal zone. Uh, and the other three said, no, it's always been fishing, following navigation, and we are just recognizing that scuba diving is in fact a form of navigation. So the big philosophical thing, if I distilled it down to one minute, is, is it exclusive? Is that all there is? Or is it exemplary such that it has room for growth? Uh, and with that, I will in fact turn it over to our two speakers who will give you centuries of history, uh, decades and centuries of law, uh, their interpretation of, of things, and you'll see some, some back and forth in terms of uh, the varying interpretations here this evening. So with that, I want to turn it over to Pete Baxter. Thank you. Is this working? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Pete Baxter. I'm very happy to be here today. I want to thank Professor Duff, Professor John Key, the University of Maine uh, Law School, and the Wells Reserve putting this on. It's, it's, it's a great uh, uh, look at the whole issue. Um, I'm also very happy to be here with Orlando. He and I have been on this for a long time, and, and I've known him for a long time. And it's, uh, I'm glad to go first because he's a professor and speaks here all the time, so I'm sure I, uh, I'm going to be behind the eight ball after he, if he went first. So, so thank you very much. Um, there are two landmark decisions we're really talking about here. One is, is, and is the, the uh, Bell cases. There are actually two decisions of Bell, which is the commonly known as the Moody Beach case. And there is the uh, Goose Rocks case. And so what I'm going to try to, I've been very privileged. I've been involved in both of those cases. I started working on the Bell case with uh, now Justice Lopez, back in 1983, when he went on the court, I, I then uh, uh, took over that case, and I've worked on that through this uh, Bruce Rice case, and it's been, it's been a, a fun history. There are a few references. Orlando's got a, he's got handouts, so he's got the teacher's quality here. Uh, I'm going to give you some references. One um, is my main law review article. It was written uh, in the summer of 2005. 
um, and that will give you some more detailed history. The other is, is a, is a book uh, called The History of Law in Massachusetts, the Supreme, Supreme Judicial Court between 1692 and 1992. There's a chapter in, in there by Ken Van Roth, the former dean of this law school, was very helpful in, in the colonial legal history. And there's also an article in Downey's Magazine that, that sort of gives a, a history of, of a lot of this by Rob Snedden. It was in July of 2014. These cases, as, as most of you know, involve beach ownership, and particularly between high and low water, which we'll call the intertidal zone as we go through this. Nevertheless, most of these cases aren't just about between high and low water. A lot of them are about the dry sand as well. But I'm going to focus on the colonial ordinance uh, mostly today, which deals with the area between high and low water, because that's the issue that Orlando and I have, have, have been uh, discussing for some 30 plus years. Um, and the, the Goose Rocks case, the Bell case is really focused on the intertidal zone. The Almeter case versus the Town of Kenny Bunk Board, so known as the Goose Rocks case, really is more about the prescriptive easements and the right to use the high dry sand. I don't think at this point that the colonial ordinance is as much of that case, but I'll talk to you later about that. So what is the colonial ordinance? In colonial Massachusetts, there was agitation that began in the 1630s uh, by the colonists because they really wanted to get their separate space from the king. And in this agitation, they worked on a document called the Body of Liberties, which is not the colonial law is, is part of, but it is, a, it is a large document, a large compendium of laws that to them was like a Bill of Rights or the Magna Carta. They were very concerned about trying to establish some, I mean, they all came from England for reasons to escape some sort of persecution and as much space as they could put between themselves and the English uh, system of laws they were trying to do. And one, and they, it has been compared to the Magna Carta. And in the article I talk, in my article I talk in great depth about this. And, uh, with me on that was a guy named George Haskins, who was a professor of colonial legal history at Penn. He has a wonderful book, too, on all of the colonial legal history, but he, he helped us with all of that research and work in the initial Bell case. So this colonial ordinance, um, which was part of the body of liberties, um, basically said that the upland owner of coastal land owns to the low water mark or, or 100 rods, which is 1,650 feet. And that the public has only these rights. They have the right to fish, to fowl, or navigate. And those were the rights that they were given by the colonial ordinance back in 1647. You'll see a number of dates. I think they started drafting part of the law in 1641, finished in 1647, published in 1648. So you see a lot of deeds with this. With it. You're also going to hear today from Orlando and others about the public trust. And in, in a simple way, because I don't have much time today, um, you know, there's a great deal of uh, discussion about this, but in, in its basic form, uh, the state, it's when the state, if the state held the intertidal land for the public benefit, as they do in many states, then it would be imbued with a public trust. Maine is different than most states. Um, so the many states where the, uh, such as Oregon and California, between high and low water, Florida, um, the intertidal zone is public, and, and it is not limited by the fishing, following, and navigation. Only Maine and Massachusetts are different. When Maine became a state in 1820, it adopted this colonial ordinance as part of its common law. The courts held that this colonial ordinance really was so part of the law that it was part of our common law, and Maine adopted that when we became a state in 1820. So what, was, what happened in the Moody Beach case, and how did this issue come to the forefront? Well, the people on Moody Beach were concerned about the public access, so they brought, because there were there were a lot of people around there, I, I, when I talked a lot on fire, I told some of the history of why they finally ended up bringing a lawsuit. 
but there were about 100 lots on Moody Beach. We represented about 29 or 30 of them. At one point, we represented 47, but we represented 29 or 30. And they brought up an action to quiet their title, to seek to say, I own Tolo Water, I'm in charge of this, and, and I, sh I should be able to control what happens in my property. Not that they wanted to keep everybody off, but they wanted the right to do that if, if it came to that. So in that case, it, right away, the state of Maine and the town brought a motion saying there's a public trust in the intertidal zone. And with that motion, the lower court judge agreed with them and said, okay, there's a public trust and therefore prohibited our clients from bringing a lawsuit to determine you know, what the rights were on, on what they felt was their land. And that's under the doctrine of sovereign immunity. And because of that motion, there was an appeal. We could go no further. So there was an appeal to the law court, which becomes Bell 1, the first, the first Bell case. And in that appeal to the law court, the only issue was, is there a public trust in the intertidal zone? That was the sole issue, because we had to resolve that issue before we could try the case. So up we went to the main Supreme Court, and Justice Caroline Glassman issued the, the decision, the first decision, and people forget this, it was unanimous. There was no dispute. The court held there was three things. The first, the state did not own the intertidal zone. Second, there was no public trust, only a public easement. And, and Justice Glassman said if there was a trustee of anything, it would be the owners and not the state of Maine. And finally, the, up, the upland owners owned this, subject to this public easement of fishing, fowling, and navigation. Now at that time, there was no discussion about what fishing, fowling, and navigation meant, just that the easement was in place. That case was remanded, and we tried the case. And I'm going to recommend to you that you uh, look up Justice Bill Broderick, who was a graduate of this law school's decision, because it's a and you compare that to the decision in the Goose Rocks case, and you'll see that Justice Broderick, he got it right. He found, for many reasons, that, you could, that there was a lack of proof. There was a second claim there, and I, sh I should explain this. So there are two issues. What are, what are the rights of the public in, in the intertidal zone? And does the public, or has the public, established that sort of adverse possession claim? called prescriptive easement, a right to use this beach because people have used it. And Judge Broderick found they had not established an adverse possession claim for several reasons. One, they didn't meet the proof. You have 100 lots, and he said somebody might have been on one lot one day, but they were on another lot another day. So for the particular owner, you didn't prove the case. And you'll see if you compare his decision to the Goose Rock's decision, he got it exactly right. He also found that under the Manchester case, that there was a presumption, that it's a presumption in Maine law, that when people are using your property, you're giving them permission. You don't have to run around and go out there and keep posting and say, if you don't mind people using your property, Maine law protects you. And he said that they did not, the, the town did not overcome that presumption of permission. So there was, after Judge Broderick's decision, the town and the state appeal. In this second appeal, they dealt only with the scope, of, or mainly with the scope of the rights in the colonial ordinance. What does fishing following the navigation mean? The state's argument there was essentially that fishing following the navigation were not words of limitation, but they meant everything, including recreation. Uh, the law court soundly rejected that argument. And, and you'll note there was much controversy in the Bell Tooth case because it was a 4-3 decision. But remember, there were the same, the three in the dissent were, there was a unanimous decision of seven in Bell 1. So it's, it is, it's confusing. How do you get to this? So anyhow, in, in Bell Tooth court, guided by its own decision of four years earlier, found that Bell 1 indeed had been decided correctly. The you know, colonial ordinance was part of Maine common law. And that the rights 
of fishing, filing, navigation were not broad rights. They were just what they said. And Justice McCusick, uh, Chief Justice McCusick, who decided the decision, um, who made that decision, said that indeed these these rights have been defined consistently throughout Maine law, to, in only in the context of fishing, filing, and navigation. Never has recreation or, or broader uses been discussed or or or, or found by the courts. Oh boy. He's telling me I got five minutes, so I got to move. So, anyhow, um, the Bell, the Bell two case, um, there was an interesting thing that happened in between. The legislature passed a law saying that the public, uh, that there was declaring that there was a public trust in the other title zone, and the, both the lower court and the law court, for different reasons, found that unconstitutional. The lower court found that it reached the separation of powers clause. The law court found it was a taking of the, both the Maine and the federal constitution. And this is a very important issue because Justice McCusick made it very clear that just as the legislature couldn't declare what the common law is, the court itself could not change their common law to deprive people of their property rights. He felt that if the court changed the colonial ordinance to be more than fishing, filing, and navigation, that would be an unconstitutional taking, both under the Maine Constitution and the federal Constitution. He stated that very clearly in the opinion. So what, what's the Goose Rocks case, now that I'm in time limit here? Um, the Goose Rocks case focus was really different than Bell. The focus in the Goose Rocks case was really on the prescriptive easement. Had the public developed a right to use this beach because they'd used it over time? The lower court found that they have, and the law court found that no, there was a lack of evidence. Uh, they hadn't established that they hadn't overcome the presumption of permission. If you take the law court decision and take Judge Broderick's decision and compare the two, you'll see how they line up because Justice Broderick got it right. Um, the, main, the law of, of, of you know, the presumption of permission has developed since the first Bell case and, and since the second Bell case, and there's a case called Lyons that strongly reinforces the presumption of permission as part of the new law. I got the two minute warning now. Um, I'm not going to get pulled off. I think you'll give me an extra minute in front of you, but I'm getting there. Um, so, that was the focus of, of the Goose Rocks case. So what's happened? Uh, there's been a motion for reconsideration. And in our view, we believe, and, and it, this, the, the Goose Rocks case is still languishing in the Supreme Court. They, there is an undecided aspect to it. And we believe that the undecided aspect to it is only the interpretation of the colonial ordinance. And that stems from the McGarvey case, which uh, Orlando makes and others. And that's the case that was mentioned by John. That's the case where three justices found one way, and three found the other way at scuba diving. And the split is this. Three found that you've got to interpret the colonial ordinance as Justice McCusick did in Bell Two. Three found that used the word public trust and threw it in there and found well, really you're really interpreting it differently than that as part of the public trust. So you're taking the interpretation of, a, of a, an easement language or you're taking the language of Justice Softly and saying we're interpreting this to determine what's reasonable uses. Although in the, in the McGarvey case they limited those uses to uses collect, connected to the water and navigation, they, they said they would limit it. Okay, but there, there's a big difference here, and that's the issue that's languishing there. Unfortunately, Justice Levy, who is on the side that I like in the McGarvey case, has left the court. And I think there's a great deal of conservation going on at that level as to how to write a decision that makes some sense and, and, and makes some sense given the prior law. In conclusion, John, <laughs> it, it, it has been very interesting for me to have been involved in this issue for so many years and, uh, and to be involved at the early stage and all along. And I know you're going to have a lot of distinguished people, including Orlando DeLogue, 
to, to give you their perspectives, but I think it's wonderful uh, what's being done by the, the law school and the uh, Wells Reserve and in bringing this issue to you and in presenting the various different sides. So thank you. I'm now the professor takes over. <laughs> I'm going to use the podium because I'm used to pacing when I uh, speak to a student and as many other groups as will tolerate uh, my pacing. Uh, the academic in me uh, uh, had the opportunity yesterday to talk to Charles Murphy's class in which I had about a 45 minutes to an hour of time in which I prepared uh, uh, some class notes. Uh, uh, having that much time uh, and being more limited today, I took yesterday's notes and, and I, I, I would make them available to all of you this evening uh, as a handout. Uh, I have uh, enough, if please don't do it, uh, people in the back can raise their hand. Uh, I also brought uh, several copies of, uh, for whatever number of you, uh, are interested, the much longer set of arguments embodied in a, a law review piece uh, uh, that is uh, entitled Friend of the Court. Uh, I've prepared amicus briefs on at least three of the cases that have gone to the law court dealing directly or indirectly with these issues. And the full title of the piece is Friend of the Court, an Array of Arguments to Urge Reconsideration of the Moody Beach Cases and Expand Public Use Rights in Maine's Intertidal Zone. Uh, that appeared in the uh, Ocean and Coastal Law Journal four years ago. Let me say at the outset again that uh, I appreciate the series of conferences that the uh, Wells uh, Estuarine uh, program has uh, put on. Two have been concluded at Loud Home Farm, this one here tonight. Uh, a third one scheduled for October 23rd back at Loud Home will feature uh, Justice Swathen, who wrote the dissenting opinion in Bell's Two, uh, in Bell Two, and, and I think it would be a worthy evening for those of you who follow these issues. Uh, as Pete mentioned, uh, there are two Moody Beach cases. The first, purportedly procedural, but actually laying out the heart of the upland owner arguments and sustaining those arguments, uh, was decided in 1986. Uh, the second, Bell II, was decided in 1989. Uh, it sustained the substantive holding of Bell I, and as Pete said, quite correctly, limited a reserved public rights to fishing, following, and navigation. I also would reiterate uh, another point that Pete made, uh, so that it's very clear in all of our minds. Massachusetts and Maine law with respect to intertidal lands is not the prevailing view in these two states alone, pursuant to the colonial ordinance of 1647, Title to intertidal lands, the lands between mean high and mean low, up to 100 rods, is held by the literal upland owner. Uh, a reserved uh, use publicum, a narrow set of public use rights, fishing, fowling, and navigation, remain in the public. The dominant view in other U.S. coastal states, England, and most other nations, is that intertidal land is owned by the public, literal upland property the rights extend only to mean hop. Since the Bell cases were decided, repeated requests to re-examine these holdings have not been taken up by the law court, notwithstanding the fact uh, that stringent tests for re-examining decided cases are seemingly met here, and that errors and omissions in both Bell cases have been laid out with increasing detail in the intervening years. 
Make no mistake, the Bell cases remain the law in Maine. Uh, that said, uh, one may ask, are there ways in which public use rights in or on intertidal lands uh, can be expanded? And the answer is yes. I should have said expanded notwithstanding the Bell decisions. The answer is yes. And Pete again has alluded to both. By prescription, a showing that the public has used a discrete area of intertidal land for uses beyond those reserved by the ordinance for 20 years or longer in a manner that is adverse to the upland owner's interest. And the Eaton case is a successful example of uh, uh, plaintiffs exercising uh, and showing to the court uh, conclusively that a prescriptive right was, uh, was gained or existed. Uh, the second, uh, I, I would note, however, parenthetically, that uh, the expanded use of uh, public rights by prescription has seemingly been made more difficult by the recently decided Almadir case. Uh, it's no wonder Pete loves uh, the, the present holding of the court. Uh, uh, a second way to expand public use rights has already been alluded to. Uh, uh, it's to show that a particular use fits within the framework of one of the reserved rights. The McGarvey case has been uh, now cited by all three of us. Uh, scuba diving is subsumed within the permitted use of navigation and, and uh, and now fits under that rubric and may be engaged in uh, uh, as a public use right uh, on intertidal uh, lands or entering the water from those intertidal lands. Uh, other speakers tonight uh, will talk about uh, other negotiated arrangements that uh, uh, would also expand the public use rights. And, and uh, I think uh, that all of these means, prescription, uh, the McGarvey rationale, negotiated arrangements are useful steps in the right direction. But because I believe that Maine should not be saddled with cases wrongly decided, I would take a giant step that more dramatically expands public use rights in intertidal lands. I would re-examine the Bell cases, acknowledge the errors, and explicitly overrule the Bell holdings. If I turn my attention to Bell 1, let me lay out four critical errors. First, the court's interpretation of the colonial ordinance is superficial at best. The ordinance is not a conveyance. There is no consideration. There is no expressed intent to alienate title to all intertidal land. There is no statement of purpose in the ordinance. Even if one accepts that wharfing out was the purpose of the ordinance. It does not require the draconian alienation of all intertidal land in an entire state to accomplish that end. Remember, too, that the Storer and Alger cases relied upon by the plaintiffs in Bell were cases decided 150 and 200 years, respectively after the colonial ordinance was written. They seem more like post hoc rationalizations of the ordinance that suited Boston commercial interests. In the intervening years, the Massachusetts legislature did not believe it had alienated all intertidal land. Grants to founding proprietors of settlements in Maine ran only to mean high piece of research I did 20 years ago involving uh, the town, what is now the town of Cumberland, but then encompassed uh, what was called the, the settlement of North Yarmouth. Uh, five towns have been splintered off from that, uh, but all of the 104 original proprietor deeds ran to Mean High. The intertidal land was thought to be and was reserved for public use. Indeed, the deeds also encumbered three rods above mean high. That's 49 and a half feet. So that lateral passage 
at even high tide, the storage of boats, the storage of fishing gear, the movement of livestock and people and wagons could conceivably be continued even at the high tide. A second Bell One error arises from the court's failure to fully recognize that Maine is not Massachusetts. <laughs> Ignoring the equal footing doctrine at the time Maine became a state in 1820 was, in my view, error. It was further error to ignore a series of U.S. Supreme Court cases. Scheibel, Pollard, Knight, Martin, all of which, and more recently I should add the Phillips Petroleum case, all of which stand for the proposition that Maine may decide its own intertidal land law post-statehood. Whatever view Massachusetts chooses to take for itself is not binding on Maine. Moreover, a series of Maine decisions predicated on received Massachusetts case law, what the court calls, the Bell Courts both call, a usage, a body of judicial legislation, cannot alienate all of Maine's intertidal land. Judicial legislation is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. Courts decide cases. The legislature establishes the law of a jurisdiction. The separation of powers principles and main case law would preclude this reliance on judicial legislation to foist the colonial ordinance on Maine. Bell one also erred in holding that the act of separation and provisions in the Maine Constitution incorporated the colonial ordinance into Maine law. This view is not borne out by a careful reading of these provisions. And finally, the Bell One Court erred, in my view, in failing to respect the 1981 opinion of the justices, which found Maine's Submerged Land Act valid. The act implicitly confirms Maine's title to unfilled intertidal land. Only filled intertidal land may be alienated to a literal upland owner. This more modest alienation of intertidal land is all that would be permitted by U.S. Supreme Court cases such as Illinois Central. You couldn't so decimate the public trust in intertidal lands as to alienate the entire coastline of a state. To alienate the entire intertidal land, I should say, of an entire state. Turning to Bell Two, the uncritical acceptance of Bell One's dismissal of equal footing, uh, given the intervening U.S. Supreme Court holding in Phillips Petroleum, a case that was decided between Bell One or after Bell One and before Bell Two. The Bell Two Court had the Supreme Court Phillips case under its nose. In a nutshell, Phillips held that the equal footing doctrine uh, uh, allows all states uh, fashioned out of the territory of other states or uh, by conquest or, or by any other means uh, would have the, the right uh, to fashion their own uh, state law. Uh, the court's characterization, the Bell Court's characterization of state arguments and the Phillips holding as revisionist history uh, seems churlish to me and ignores the fact that the Supreme Court in Phillips reached back 171 years, 171 years, to correct error with respect to the ownership of intertidal Mississippi land. Second, limiting public use rights to three stated uses ignores the fact that historically the Jews' public, public use rights, like common law, evolved over time and was broader even in 1647 than those noted in the ordinance. In 1647, historical documents make clear 
that lateral passage for persons, livestock, wagons, was a common public use in that day. The cutting of seagrass, the grazing of livestock, being upon the beach simply for whatever aesthetic value it may have, were all tolerated and were extant public uses in 1647. Finally, the Bell Two Courts finding that Maine's Intertidal Lands Act is a taking is simply not consistent with historical or recent takings cases. The court may say it, but that doesn't make it so. It is uh, on questionable uh, grounds, or on even more questionable grounds, given the recent Supreme Court holding, also decided before Bell II, stop the beach reed nourishment. No property interest of the upland owner is impermissibly taken by the Intertidal Lands Act. Regulated, yes. Taken, no. I'll stop. <laughs> I'll reserve my minute. Uh, interpretations, and, and now you have them. Um, and it doesn't end there. We've got folks who will be complementing some of these issues with their own discussions and perspectives. Let me fill in a couple of informational gaps that, that we did not outline um, at the outset of this evening. Uh, Amy Chow will be talking to you in a moment as the first of a number of responders. One of the other responders with us this evening is, is Ben Leone. He's an attorney with Curtis uh, Thaxter. He is um, a litigator. He's representing the folks at Goose Rocks Beach. And he's the only person I know that I can describe as an award-winning law review author. Right? <laughs> People just think that if you, if you write and publish, that's the award. But in fact, one of his articles actually uh, merited uh, an award. So we've got Amy, and then we've got a series of other responders. Uh, we will open it up to folks uh, for Q&A after that. So with that, I'll hand it over to Thank you, John. I wanted to also echo everyone uh, else's uh, thanks to the speakers for me, um, to uh, the Wells Estuary Nature Reserve and the work that Paul Desk has put together uh, you know, to bring all of this together, as well as the law school. I am a, a graduate of the University of Maine Law in 1993. I hope it doesn't date myself uh, too much here. Uh, but uh, Professor Norkey, Professor DeLogue, um, thank you for hosting this panel. Um, as many of you know, I represented the town of Kennebunk Wharf and had the great privilege to uh, be, and still am, the town attorney for the town of Kennebunk Wharf in the Al Meter case um, that, uh, that we are going to be discussing tonight. And I think I'm going to be taking, my comments are a little bit different, um, um, and they're really in recognition, I think, of the interplay between the legal and the poli public policy elements of what we're talking about here. I think all of us recognize there's a delicate balance between um, public access rights when we're talking about intertidal lands, our beaches, our seacoast, and private property rights. And so the question is, what do we do with that balance? And how is that balance um, shifted over time? And um, but one thing to mention before we get into the law is that Maine is an outlier state. So for, you know, regardless of what our law is, Stephanie Otts of the National Sea Grant um, Educational Law Center um, gave a great presentation in the first panel and really brought home the point that, that, that Maine as a state is really out of step with virtually every other state um, in the nation on the issue of what rights the public has um, to use our beaches. Um, it's a low water state. It's uh, in, in virtually every other state in the country. Um, the, the intertidal lands to high water mark are either owned by the state in trust for the public, or uh, there are elements in, in their state's constitutions that say, no, these lands are here for the public. And I think what Orlando has just talked about with the colonial ordinance and the Jews publicum, there's a question about whether these lands should be treated differently than, for example, our open tracts of undeveloped woodlands that snowmobilers and hunters and others use um, in the state. So I'll get back to that. Um, in a moment. But what's ironic about the fact that we're so out of step, in my view, with other states in the country on this issue of public access to our beaches, and I'll just do a little shout out to the state of California. Those of you may have, uh, um, have read 
that uh, uh, on a beach in San Mateo County in Half Moon Bay, Martins Beach, that the court just reopened that to the public. Um, again, very different state of law, but this is the trend that we're dealing with in this country. But what's ironic is that in Maine, with 3,500 miles of coastline, we are a state in which uh, our coastline is a defining feature to the state and its people, and a vitally important part of our state's tourist economy. So here we have the balance now shifting after Almeida, um, and a state that has 3,500 miles of coastline that is such an important part of um, both the economic and the sort of cultural engine of our, of our state. So with that, um, the law court's ruling in the Goose Rocks Beach case as it stands, and we are hopeful that it will uh, be changed, um, but as it stands now, it really upsets that delicate balance between public and private rights. Um, and it really, uh, the rights are now skewed so heavily in favor of private property landowners that basically we are leaving our state's coastline um, in, entirely in the hands of private property owners and entirely to their will. And so you can say, one private landowner might say, I'm going to be magnanimous and I will encourage public use, and that's wonderful. But the next private landowner who may come along may not be so magnanimous. And that's the concern when we have such a history that goes back, as far as Orlando has described, as to how we have treated our intertidal inter lands. Okay. What were the flaws, uh, in my opinion, that the law court made in the Goose Rocks Beach case? Um, Pete talks about how there are two important cases, Bell on the one hand and Al Meter in the Goose Rocks Beach case on the other hand. There are some cases in between, actually, that I believe are, are equally important. So if you, if you like this issue, and for those of you who are students, I think I'll just list a number of cases that I think you should read if you haven't already. The Bell cases, both the 1986 and 1989 case. The Eden case from 2000, which has been referred to. The Lyons case from 2002. The Flaherty v. Muther case. Um, and the McGarvey case, the scuba diving case from 2011, and then the Almeter case from 2014. And what's important um, in all of that is that the only, of those cases, the only case to address the public's rights by way of a prescriptive easement and what the standard of that, uh, what the standard should be in this state is the Eaton versus Town of Welch case. And that case has not until questioning in our Goose Rock speech case, was not overturned by the Lyons case. In fact, the Lyons case, which Pete references the presumption of permission, and I think he rightly addresses that the presumption of permission was addressed in that case. Um, the Lyons case, far from saying Eaton is no good, it actually said Eaton stands up as the only example we have for, it, for declaring a public prescriptive easement on a beach, a coastal beach in Maine. So we should be looking at Eaton for de determining whether such, such an easement does exist. And that's in fact what the court, what we were asking the court to do in the Goose Rock Beach case. Because if you look at the facts in Eaton and the facts in the Goose Rock Beach case with respect to adverse use and, the ad and what the Lyons case and the Eaton case said proved adverse use sufficient to overcome the presumption of permission and say, yes, there's a public prescriptive easement. It's the same set of facts. It's a, a century-long history of town maintenance, patrol, police, lifeguards on this beach, from end to end, um, maintenance, uh, insect spraying, uh, as well as advertisement by the town, and, and, and lots of testimony over three weeks of trial indicating, um, I say uh, two minutes, that there was, um, uh, adverse use. And so beachfront property owners who bought, when they bought their properties, they bought knowing full well that all of this use was going on and that they were taking their property subject to those rights that existed. The, but the, the flaw that the law court, I believe, rested on in this open lands tradition for saying that the, we have to have this uh, presumption of permission, which, which we agreed applied but was overcome in this case, is they referred to this open lands tradition. And the, and the central flaw about that was, here's the argument. The argument is, if we uh, don't presume that this um, 
that, that this use, a public use, is by permission, then uh, landowners will suddenly close off and fence off their properties for passive recreational use. And in fact, the snowmobilers filed an amicus brief in this case, thinking, oh my god, does this mean that we can't, um, that, that, we, that we'll have to fence off our properties? And there are two answers to that question. Um, first, in the 14 years since the Eaton case came down, finding a public prescriptive easement, has anyone fenced off their properties, their private beach properties? Has anyone seen that happen? I've not seen it happen. Second, there is a statute in the state of Maine that, that is overlooked here that is very easily applied to overcome an inchoate public prescriptive easement. Um, all, it, all it takes is either a recording in the registry or posting on your property for six successive days, once every 20 years. And that will be sufficient to, to defeat a prescriptive easement. You don't need to fence your properties. But the, but the big thing that I want to focus on in conclusion is the other aspect of that argument that has been argued for why we need a presumption of permission that essentially the law court has said is impossible to overcome now. And the reason we need that is we need to make sure that our open land stay open. The law court mistakenly lumped in beaches as a type of land with the open tracts of land that are inland that of course snowmobilers and hunters want to use and we don't want to prevent that. But how are beaches different? Beaches are terribly different. First of all, there's development pressure. Second of all, there's a juice public and, and a colonial ordinance. It already, there already are public trust rights in these lands. Third of all, um, you're going to see open and notorious use of the beach in a way that you can't when uh, you've got undeveloped woodlands that people are sort of passively using. So there, there's a very big distinction. And, and, and the argument has been actually um, the presumption of permission um, actually will encourage landowners to open up their land. That argument was made to the law court. The law court obviously saw that as a public policy argument. Oh no, the snowmobilers will be worried um, if, uh, and actually what this does, this presumption of permission, this idea that we don't have to defend our rights in some way, will actually encourage land, private property owners to open up their beach properties, right? Well, I will ask you, I think the, the, the disproof of that is, are these two photos that were taken on Moody Beach, which is the subject of um, the, uh, the Bell case, which was recently taken. So far from encouraging public use, we now have signs on Moody Beach that say, private beach, no loitering. Have those beaches remained open to the public? And have those landowners been encouraged to open their lands to the public? I would say not. And so I, I would hope that the law court would reconsider, not just on the prescriptive easement basis, because what they've done now is eliminated. That is an argument, if it, if it stands. But also, it puts a lot of pressure on this question of what does the public trust doctrine mean? What does the colonial ordinance mean? What does fishing, fouling, and navigation mean? And are, were those intended to be exclusive rights? I would argue they were not. And I hope the law court agrees with me. Thank you. Parkinson. I'm an attorney in Kenny Monk, and I come at this from a little, a slightly different perspective. Uh, I had the rare opportunity to be the attorney in one of these significant cases, the Eaton versus Wells case, uh, representing the town of Wells uh, that has been mentioned. And, and also, I was the mediator, court appointed uh, mediator, mediator with Justice Court in the Alameda versus Town of Kenny Monk court case, uh, starting with the Eaton case, uh, I have uh, so many memories of it, uh, even though it's, uh, it was in the late 1990s. And, and one of the things, uh, as an attorney, why it was so rare and great to be involved with it was the fact that you actually had the ability to hire on your team experts, such as genealogists, surveyors, historians. I learned so much about uh, the history of the, my own area that I didn't know about uh, previously. Uh, for example, that the, the uh, concept of recreating on a beach really is an industrial age concept that came in in the 1900s after uh, factories were built in New England and trains uh, came up and hotels were built. Uh, prior to that time, uh, we were in an agrarian economy 
and people didn't have vacations and they didn't have time to, uh, to recreate. And so these problems sort of developed in, in the 1900s. Although um, one of the historians we hired pulled out a book called The Playful Puritans, and actually had drawings <laughs> of a you know, Puritan bathing suit to were able to pull it, try to pull it back in the Puritan area. I don't know how playful the Puritans really were. <laughs> The, the second thing is about what was a beach and what is the importance of, of the beach. And, and it's been alluded to, the beach was really a north-south highway for many years. And on the major rivers, there were a little ferry that would take you. Uh, and, and we found deeds and paperwork that talked about the road from Kittery to Casco. And I think that's what Portland was called previously, Casco. And so you'd go up on your wagon um, and hit a, hit a river, go over on a little barge across, and then keep going. And part of the reason for that was that the uh, inland was so densely populated. I mean, the, the, the forest was so darn thick, and, and, the, and there was many uh, engagements with the, the Indian Wars uh, that it was thought to be unsafe. And a lot of the um, uh, immigrants from England who came over said, this is just too scary to be inland. It's too dark. They're used to, like, opened up farmland areas. They wanted to be on the beach. And that's why I'm told, and I'm really doing some reductionist history here, is that the, the king ordered the king's highway to be built. He was like, you know, this is over, let's have our real highway. And so your Route 1 and King's Highway was a result of an alternative to going up the beach. So um, that was a fascinating aspect of the Eaton versus uh, Wells case. So I guess the takeaway for me, when people come up and ask me, you know, what is the law of beach ownership, or what is the law of, of the public use of a beach in Maine, and I would say, it depends, and that's not a great answer for a lawyer, it, de it depends, and it's very fact specific, and in the Eaton case, there were very strong facts, and you read those decisions, almost overwhelming, unrebutted facts about the uh, public use of the beach, and so it was really fun for me to totally immerse myself in, in those small details of those facts, of going to the historical society. I can remember one looking through hundreds of postcards going back to the day. And it was a postcard from a lady, one woman to another woman saying, I will see you later today at the beach. Can you imagine that, writing a postcard to someone that was delivered that day? It's almost as good as an email. <laughs> later today at the beach. So um, we were fortunate enough to uh, work through that. Um, there was an, another whole part of uh, that case, which is the title part, which is unresolved. In the, uh, Goose Rock's uh, case, uh, that the town lost very complicated aspect of the, that case, but the town uh, prevailed on the uh, prescriptive easement part. So um, with that background, I think that played into my uh, being able to become a part of, as a mediator in the Goose Rock's speech case, with the consent of the parties, which I appreciated very much, and, and the funding of the uh, Kenny Montport Conservation Trust, I was able to participate in that process with Justice Horton. Um, it's, of course, as a mediator, totally unethical to talk about anything that happened behind closed doors or you know, give any kind of indication of favoritism on one side or another in, in a mediation, and, and I won't do that. I just wanted to just talk about the process of it because it was pretty, um, pretty different for me as a mediator. And uh, there was uh, basically three or four days of mediation. Uh, we had to get the town hall. Uh, and we had, so we had various stakeholders. We had the beachfront owners. We had different uh, groups of beachfront owners. We had the so-called backlot owners. We had the town officials, and, and they were corralled in different rooms, and I, and I, and I know some of the people uh, were the part of that uh, can attest. There was a lot of boredom and frustration of attempting to uh, get that uh, communication going. But everybody definitely showed up and participated, and, and some progress was made. And, uh, it was um, a really good process, I think. You know, maybe the process could have been started earlier, and I know Ben's going to speak about that, about how we can uh, perhaps get, engage better in, in community dialogue in these cases. Uh, but uh, as a mediator, it was a, it was a real challenge. Um, it, the, the pitch I would end up with um, one minute to go here, or two minutes to go, is you know, we hopefully can find ways to keep these cases out of court and one of the sort of the dirty little secrets of these cases is just how darn expensive they are. And um, I don't know what the real numbers are, but I have a feeling they're at least in the six figures and maybe in the seven figures. And, and is there a better way? You know, is there a, a, a way that we can uh, kind of move beyond 
um, having these, these battles up and down the, up and down the coast and, and not do it through the court system. So I set you up that for your presentation. <laughs> Well, like you heard, my name is Ben Leone, and uh, I'm one of the attorneys that represent property owners at Goose Rocks Beach. Um, I'm not going to, uh, some of you are probably wondering how I'm going to respond to Amy, and I'm not going to right now. Um, I feel lucky enough to speak in front of you all because you're interested in this topic. Um, that's why you're here, and I hope that you're interested enough that you may want to go in and read some of the legal briefs, the legal arguments before the law court, and if you haven't read the decision in Goose Rocks, I would encourage you to actually go online, it's free, and you can read it. Um, that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions that people might have uh, afterwards, um, because today I'm here to talk about what Derwood mentioned, which is uh, avoiding these types of disputes through negotiating for access. Um, so far, what we've heard uh, primarily is um, a discussion about what are the legal rights that apply in the intertidal zone and uh, above the intertidal zone on the beach uh, for the public and the property owners. And whether it's a town or a private landowner who comes to us as attorneys and asks, what are our rights to the beach? Um, we as lawyers are pretty well trained to answer that question. Um, and what I would like to focus on today is asking a different question and figuring out how to deal with the answer to that question, which is, what are the interests, concerns, or fears that led you to come see a lawyer to figure out your rights in the first place? Um, lawyers can be quite creative, but haven't been historically trained with how to deal with the answers to those questions in ways that break the mold outside of the court process um, to and outside of seeking a court to declare your rights. So I think this is a really important issue because most cases over beach access don't just concern the intertidal zone. I could only find one beach access case that just concerned the intertidal zone. So even if we change the colonial ordinance law, what's that, how, where are we gonna be? We're still gonna be fighting over about the high dry sand. We're still gonna be fighting over what I call perpendicular access to the beach. Um, and so there's three real ways to settle a dispute. Um, one is to rely on power. Um, that is sort of uh, using leverage or force to coerce someone into act. To coerce someone to act, you can adjudicate rights. That's what we do in our court system. We go to a court, listen to the arguments, and have somebody decide you have these rights, you have that right, those rights. The third way is to reconcile interests. Um, the first two ways that I mentioned always pick winners and losers. The third way decide, doesn't choose winners or losers it is a way to figure out how, what are the mutual interests that people have, how can we satisfy those mutual gains, and basically increase the pie that everyone gets at the end of the day. Um, I think Goose Rocks, um, in some ways, was a necessary case to open people's eyes to how much money can be involved in these disputes and how long they can last. This case started in 2009, and we haven't even litigated the title issues yet. Um, so with that said, there are a couple examples of some success stories um, in Maine where people have negotiated outside of the courtroom uh, how to get public access. Uh, if you go down to Parsons Beach in Kennebunk, most people think that's a public beach. It's actually privately owned, and there is an agreement between the landowners and the town that created terms for public access to that beach. Crescent Beach State Park is another one. Um, it's, there's a large portion of that state park that is privately owned, and the state basically pays for public access. I don't think that that's an incredibly imaginative solution, but it's one that seems to work in that case. And then the Maine Island Trail Association uh, has 350 miles of coastline that they connect. A lot of those, uh, a lot of the campsites that Maine Island Trail Association uh, uses are on private property. Every single year, MIDA goes back and they negotiate with those landowners and uh, figure out what they need to do to get the landowner, usually for free, to continue to allow people to use that property. So these are good success stories for 
issues where you have usually just one landowner and a couple people. Um, I want to talk about a process that can be used and is effective when you're talking about a major resource that may be owned by hundreds of people um, where the interests in that property concern an entire community. Um, those are cases like Goose Rocks and Eaton and who knows what happens next. Um, but I hope that the next one utilizes the following process. Um, and just so you know, this process I'm about to use is not, is not my, I, they're not my ideas. These were developed by the Lincoln Institute and by scholars that have studied how to settle land use disputes without resorting to litigation and have culminated from decades and decades of research. Um, there's four steps. The first step is called an assessment. The second step is where you design the process for collaboration. The third step is where you facilitate the deliberation. The fourth step is what's called implementation of outcomes, and I'm going to talk about each one briefly. The first step in assessment is where you hire a uh, professional facilitator. Um, there are a lot of them out there that do this as their job, and they go out and they start conducting confidential interviews. Um, when it comes to a beach, it may be interviews with beachfront owners, interviews with backlot owners, interviews with people in within the community or representatives of the town. They try to figure out what are the interests driving this conflict, and they try to figure out whether there's mutual gains to be made. Um, once the asset, because not all, not all disputes uh, can be settled this way. And when you get an assessor, it's a cheap way to have somebody come in, decide whether they think it's going to make sense for the parties to engage in this kind of dispute or not. And the answer may be no but at least now you know. Um, so the second step of the process is if the answer is yes, we can do something, we can use the mutual gains approach. Um, in that step, you design a process for collaboration. And what the scholars have, have really researched and figured out is that the design of the process is as important as the participation of the players and as important in gaining a, a, uh, a solution as anything. Um, so they will help design a process that facilitates consensus. One common theme um, for these approaches is that you generally get consensus among all the parties. Um, it's hard to believe when we sit here, but there's a number of success stories um, about consensus building. So um, the second step, like I said, design a process for collaboration. It's got to be open and inclusive. So a lot of times when you have representatives of parties coming together to talk about these issues, it's also open for people in the public to come listen to it. Very different from court-required mediation that we have in Maine, where everything happens behind closed doors. And the public has no idea what's going on until the cookie's been baked and it comes out of the oven. Um, the second um, part of this is you need to require consensus. Consensus forces the parties to confront the issues that are driving the conflict and satisfy everybody. Um, the third step is facilitate deliberation. Um, this is really the hands-on part where you, where you hash out what the agreement's gonna be. It takes a while. Um, most negotiations skip straight to this step. Um, and that's what happened at Goose Rocks. We basically went, it was moments before trial, and we went straight to deliberation. We hadn't really thought about constructing a process. And at the same time, in that case, what you had was you had people negotiating a month before trial, and then as soon as they got out of the negotiating room, people are filing motions, attacking each other. It's an adversarial process that they're engaged in. It's hard to come into a consensus building arrange, arrangement but, um, here and then walk out of that room and go back into <coughs> adversarial mode. Um, there have been cases that where if you have already started the process, um, there's a case in New York which actually ordered to stay in a lawsuit to force the parties into this um, type of negotiation. And finally, the, the last phase is implementation of outcomes. You need to set something in place that creates a, a legally enforceable um, agreement, whether that's the ordinances, contracts, or leases. Um, so the benefits here are um, this type of uh, process addresses issues that the court simply can't. The court can say, you have the rights on the beach, you don't. They can't 
they can't settle issues like parking. They can't settle issues like perpendicular access. Um, it builds communities instead of tears it apart. Um, I think that's especially applicable to, to Goose Rocks. Again, an adversarial process. And um, finally, it forces the parties that are engaged in that in process to take an ownership in the solution, and they find that these agreements are relatively well uh, self-policed. People, people make the solution. It's not a solution that's imposed on them. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, and I want to thank the Wells Reserve and the law school for putting this on and, and for your interest in it. Um, I hope that, that discussions like these turn people's attentions away from who's right, who's wrong, and start um, drawing people's attentions to how do, we prove, how do we create a process and are there other ways. So with that, thank you. This thing has um, progressively faded through the evening. I don't know if that's a message or if everybody's feeling that way themselves. The advantage, my name is Tim Glidden. I'm the president of the Maine Coast Heritage Trust, and I'm very pleased to be here. And also, like the other speakers have said, appreciate the law school and uh, the wealth reserves efforts to pull together this group of people uh, on an important topic. The advantage of going last <laughs> is that many of the things that I might have said have been said. So um, I'm going to just pass over those pieces. I would observe that. You know, even just even though I have followed this, I am a forester. Let me quickly say, so you're now hearing from the first non-lawyer of the night. Uh, I've I've learned a lot of important and pieces of how we need to be thinking about this project, of this project, this this issue, and in some cases my concerns have been allayed, and in other cases they've maybe been exacerbated. So, you know, there's clearly a lot more to talk about on this issue, um, and I hope I hope this will be part of that continuing process. I just so I just want to make a few observations in here from my own perspective, both personally um, in the time I've been in Maine working on environmental issues, and also as president of the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. You know, the first of them is that in all the time that I've been working on a wide range of environmental issues. Access to water and the quality of water has been the most important issue that people have made. It always polls at the top of the list. Um, and that hasn't changed in 40 or 50 years. People who live in Maine, people who visit Maine, they love the waters of the state, and of course I'm including more than just the coastal waters, um, although 75% of the population of the state of Maine lives in a coastal town. So that's, that's where the people are. Um, the other piece of that is that um, before I came to Maine Coast Heritage Trust, I ran the Land for Maine's Future program. And the Land for Maine's Future program, its popularity was based, again, right back on that love of public access. That's what people are looking for. When you all, and I'm sure every one of you have voted for the bond issues that have come up, um, those bond issues win by close to two-third margins every time they come up. And that's because people want this kind of access. So there's clearly a really deep hunger um, for this kind of access. Not just coastally, obviously, but in other cases. And yet, that access is questionable in a lot of ways. We have a wonderful tradition in the state of Maine of this, I'm speaking as a non-lawyer here, but it's sort of a permissive use of private lands, and you've heard a lot of detail about presumptions of which way those go and all that kind of good stuff, but the person on the street is not thinking about their legal position when they walk onto a piece of land. They're just thinking about, oh, you know, geez, there's no house, there's no this, there's no that, I've been going here for years, I'm going. Um, and that kind of access is really key to really the culture of the state of Maine. Um, I was interested in Amy's points on sort of the reaction since Eden and a couple of those other cases about well, what has actually happened there. And I, I couldn't answer your question specifically on has a beach been closed off since then. I am not aware of one. But I am aware 
that there's a broader trend in the state of Maine to the posting of land that has been happening. It's been a concern for a long, long time. So that's an important piece to keep in mind here. And when, when those cases came up, and this is where I was feeling a little bit assured, um, we, at Maine Coast Heritage Trust and many of the land trusts in the state where we work with private landowners and are very concerned about their reactions to various things, the argument around prescriptive rights and establishing those does cause land trusts a lot of concern because they're not afraid that necessarily people would be, what they're afraid of is people would make ill-informed decisions afterwards and if something like you, you were talking about the snowmobilers, that the, even if people didn't understand the legal niceties of what the ruling actually meant, they would just go right straight to close close it off. I don't want to have anything to do with it, just close it off. So there's a concern there. And at the same time, the land trust community also, I think, broadly feels that there should be some broader interpretation, that there should be some evolution of what is considered the the, what those uses were in the original colonial ordinance and those three terms that have been rattled off a number of times tonight, you know, are we really locked into that? Are we really in sort of an originalist argument on that question? Or have that, has that evolved over time? And I think if you talk to most land trust folks, you would say, you know, boy, there really has been an evolution of the public need and the public use of these lands over time, and that's something we should come back to. So, Turning then just to a couple of points, and thank you, Ben, for picking up a couple of those pieces. Some of the alternatives. Obviously, in the land trust world, what we do is we get easements and we get um, fee purchases. So when confronted with an access problem on the coast or an access demand on the coast, our reaction is typically to go out and either get a donation of fee or easement rights or buy it. Um, and Maine is now, speaking broadly, uh, has gone from about 5% in some form of conservation um, to about 20% 20, 20 conserved in the state. And vast amounts of that now in those easements, and now we're not on the coast, we're up north, um, vast amounts of that do include public rights of access. So there's a lot of action that happens on that score when these things can't otherwise be worked out. It's all willing landowner, willing buyer basis, none of that is through eminent domain or any other things. But there is a channel there. Um, it does cost money, um, but it is, it is one of the things to do. Um, Long-term leases, you mentioned. Um, the Crescent Beach one is the one that came to mind for me. Um, in addition to the MITA example, which I think you rightly pointed out, it is a really interesting, it's been around for about 25 years now, I think. Um, extends up and down the coast, and land trusts work with MITA on that as well. Um, the other one I would I would um, offer up as an example, very similar, is the Georges Highland Trail, where there's a 50-mile trail network in the mid-coast area that is entirely on a handshake basis, um, where, in this case, it's the Georges River Land Trust, has basically negotiated with landowners to get public access for a 50-mile trail. It's really quite a remarkable operation. Um, I think those models, can, if you get in early enough, before maybe the heat rises, those kind of models can be deployed in a lot of useful ways. So I would just go stop wrap it at that, and um, there's some folks here who will probably fall asleep before they get to ask a question. I don't to go much longer with the so, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now going to open it up uh, to questions, and we hope you do have some questions. We, we want to maintain this as a conversation. We've done that in the previous two discussions. We'll do it this evening, and we'll do it in the next session at uh, Wells Reserve. Uh, there have been a lot of associated materials. Um, I don't know if it's because we're lawyers and teachers, um, or, or because we, we understand that there's a genuine interest in uh, UFAX having a burning desire to go read all of these cases and these histories we are alluded to. We'll, we'll construct a bibliography, and Maine Sea Grant uh, has been instrumental over the course 
Uh, well, as long as I, when I lived in Maine and since uh, I moved away, Maine Sea Grant has been phenomenal in terms of being a forum. They supported this forum, um, and they will be hosting a website where some new materials will be posted. So we'll either post them or we'll have links via the website uh, that you can reach there. Um, I just want to uh, mention one thing that I recognized uh, as Tim was talking, because I think a fair number of the questions of these, or, at these discussions uh, revolve around ownership. But it was until Tim started speaking that I, I thought, oh, wait a minute, there's something other than ownership. There's stewardship that we need to be concerned about as well. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive, but I think if you focus on one to the exclusion of the other, you lose the sense and, and the necessity to really deal with issues of stewardship as well. So with that, I'll, I'll open up uh, to questions, and, and you can direct them to anyone in particular or to the group as a whole. Yes, sir. I understand from our meetings and news rocks that we spent a sizable amount of tax money to do a title by title research of roughly 120 properties, any of the previous ownership of big chunks of the beach area. Uh, our previous city man town manager presented that at some of our meetings. And I understand the court said we hadn't dealt with property by property analysis. I thought we had paid sizable amount of money for that. And is it at all instructive of how people over the years treated the intertidal area or even the dry sand? So I'm going to ask someone to summarize that and then respond so that we pick up uh, the gist of the question on the recording as well. Would that be me? Sure. <laughs> so, so the two aspects, there are two aspects uh, to the Goose Rock speech case. Um, title, not to be confused with Tidal, right? T-I-T-L-E, not T-I-D-A-L. Um, and who uh, had title, and, and um, you're right that there were 30 some odd deeds that were examined. Um, and, and you asked, I think, what's the relationship between the proceedings around title, and there were summary judgment proceedings, and what I will say is that both parties, both the plaintiffs and the town, filed cross motions for summary judgment, and summary judgment was denied to both sides. So what the court, in essence, is saying, the trial court said in that case, um, on the title questions, is we're going to reserve that. There's still can then referred correctly to the fact that we still haven't tried the issue of title and whether, regardless of what the deeds may say, um, and some of them do indeed say they go down to the Atlantic Ocean. Some of them say I own as far down to the Atlantic Ocean as I as I might own, and maybe I don't own it. So there's a quick claim clause, and others say uh, I own to the seawall, and so there's a, that issue has not been litigated. So what you're referring to, though, I think is the issue that came up in the, what I call the equitable use of the public prescriptive easement part of the case, which is really fact specific. And that's, I think everyone agreed that with a three week trial, we have to look at how the beach is actually used, not actually what, the, what it says in the deed. And in that case, the law court in referring um, to a number of things in the decision said that, um, the evidence didn't come in parcel by parcel of, of what kind of use was being made at the beach. And, um, and so um, in, on reconsideration, the town argued, well, there certainly was evidence um, that was unique to parcels. And, um, and of course, even Ben argued, no, it was all the same. And, but it, it, it's true that the law court said, without a parcel by parcel analysis, of how um, the portions of each were used, um, the evidence is insufficient. Now, I would argue if that's true, that's a new pronouncement of a standard that hadn't yet been announced by the court. And, and the logical thing for the law court to do would be to remand it to the trial court to um, look at that issue and, and to ask for findings on a parcel. So I, I saw a question over there, but I want to give other folks an opportunity if they want to chime in on that issue. Um, this, uh, on the issue of the parcel by parcel proof, um, I think that's always been the law. There was, you have to have evidence of use of anybody's property. There was no evidence of any adverse use of Bob Alameda's property, for example. You can't take use of a neighbor 
10 miles or, or two miles away at the other end of the beach and assume that that happened on your parcel because otherwise you have no ability to protect your parcel. The law court saw that as extremely unfair and the judge didn't rule parcel by parcel. I certainly told him he had to uh, and, and the town told him he didn't. So that issue has gone by the board in my view. The issue of the title I think has gone by the board too because the town's original claim was based on a 1684 deed, which the judge at least decided, he didn't decide much, the lower court judge, but at least decided that that deed conveyed nothing to the town. So we believe the title issue is over if that's the premise of the town's title. So there's a lot out there still going on, but um, you know, I think the law court's decision was very sound and it was not a change at all. As I mentioned earlier, the decision of Justice Broderick in the Bell One case used exactly the same logic, relied on the Manchester case, which discussed the public, which was a beach in, uh, on a lake uh, in the town of Manchester, and relied on that same, same case and said this beach use was permissive use and there's a presumption of permission, and that's the law. And, and so I, this has been around a long time. I don't agree there's been a change in the law. I think that the, the presumption of permission has been there for a long time. So those are two comprehensive responses to, to their question. I, I see a hand over there. Yeah, regarding the titles. So first of all, why was um, the beach given to the ocean fronts based on one title? I guess you said that Moody and the Blue Rocks or a minority of titles. And then secondly, didn't the state give the ocean front owners free land in ruling that they own the beach? The titles to these properties. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the colonial ordinance on which the whole title in Bell One, Bell Two, uh, the claim of title to the intertidal land turns on the colonial ordinance. The colonial ordinance was a gift. There was no consideration. There was no reciprocal duty imposed on on the uh, the beneficiary of the gift. Uh, they may have a property. Uh, the words themselves, three words in the colonial ordinance, shall have property. Historians will tell you was itself ambiguous. It, 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 it had the, the, a common meaning that they will have a priority. A priority to do what? To wharf out, to fill an intertidal land for commercial purposes. If they wharfed out, they would be given title to the intertidal land. If they didn't wharf out, presumably they would, uh, uh, the, the pre-existing law, before there was a colonial ordinance, in other words, there was English common law which said that intertidal lands were held by the king in trust for the people. So the fact that the ordinance has con seemingly conveyed the intertidal land of an entire state free to upland owners is a gift, pure and simple. And the people in Maine who have parlayed the colonial ordinance, which may be the extant law in Massachusetts if they so choose, into making it the extant law of Maine, uh, are simply the inherited beneficiaries of the gift. There may be another response. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in my law review article, I covered this, and, and there's a long history of this. And uh, first, Justice Glassman didn't agree with what Orlando just said about prior English law. She said English law too also gave the orders to the low water mark. But second, the history, the entire history of the body of liberties in the colonial ordinance was just to do that, separate this so that the colonists had control of this land. And these folks' deeds, we run back to the 17th century, straight back. There's no town, no state, nobody else. They came through the English proprietors, and they, came, they were granted deeds from people who had grants from the kings, and they followed those deeds through. We can follow these titles all through. So it, there's, a, there's a huge difference in that. I just totally disagree. But Orlando and I have yeah, been disagreeing for a long time. Can you answer the first part of the question? So why was the ruling based on a minority of what I understand, there was a minority of deeds that owned the lower one. The, the ruling, majority owned the high one. The ruling on the deeds, there's been no ruling on the deeds yet. Okay. Um, 
So it's, it's so they were given free land. Well, the state's initial claim to title, and I take the position that the, the issue was over, and, and another issue to be dealt with on appeal was that they had this land by virtue of the deed in 1684. Once the judge said this deed doesn't didn't give you title to the town, I think the case is over. But those titles are still an issue to be decided. Oh, can I respond to that? I just want to take issue um, on the issue of title because the town's only argument about um, whether the town had title um, by way of this deed, I don't think that that issue is over. Motion, uh, motions for summary judgment were denied. Um, there's yet to be a trial on that issue and, and we expect that evidence um, will be admitted on that issue. But even if that were true, um, you have to remember that t um, real estate and title law depends upon the idea that you can't gain title to something that was never conveyed to you in the first place. And so the town has taken, and, and Pete's, uh, Pete's folks have taken the title back um, on all of the plaintiffs, and there are a number of plaintiffs whose very deeds say that their, their property runs to the seawall or to the seashore, which in, um, under law court precedent is something certainly shoreward, landward, of the low water mark. And so there's a real open question as to whether, remember the colonial ordinance, if it applies, is it applies as a presumption. Presumptions can be overcome by proof of actual title or absence of title. So that issue is wide open we believe. So I like back and forth. The question with back and forth is always, when do you move to the next question? So um, I'm wondering if anyone has anything imperative on this issue. Otherwise, I see at least one or two other hands. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you talked about Goose Rocks, that, um, it sounded very similar to the um, current case with Cedar Beach and Bailey Island. Um, I understand. Well, I'm not. Um, I'm not a law student or anything, but I, my family's owned property on Bailey Island for 50 plus years, and um, there are certainly natives of that island and three families from out of state. Um, came and purchased property at the point where the beach is down there and two of those families, well, one family closed it off in 2011 and another person um, bought their property and she has also closed off the land. Um, but just recently, um, the Cedar Island, um, All right, let me just read the article. It's in the part. I think Can I, we interrupt? Uh, I think I could answer Cedar, that. Cedar Beach does not concern uh, the beach as such. It's a way of access to the beach. Right. Uh, and it's, the it's court. The only access. Yes. So, so, so it's a collateral issue. Access is important. Uh, at this point, the. the, the, the uh, the Bell 1 and Bell 2 cases apply to the uh, beach areas uh, on Cedar Beach that are referred to as Cedar Beach. Uh, how you get to those beach areas, though, was uh, uh, by permission. Uh, did we shut that off at some point? Uh, how you get to those areas uh, has always been. Uh, a difficult proposition. It's been difficult in other areas of Maine besides uh, this one. The lower court held, uh, a la Eaton, uh, that a prescriptive right to use a what was characterized a private way, which had been used by the public for many years, was established. I'm sure that that decision of the Superior Court will be appealed, and the law court will have to determine uh, on one hand, whether to follow uh, Eaton, a, a prescriptive right was shown, or to follow the lower court's holding in Bell, a prescriptive right was not shown. And the access to the beach will either exist along that road or it will not when the law court has finally decided the case. Uh -huh. um, I know in this article it says it will be appealed. Um, I think the attorney that's on the Cedar Beach side um, has said that because there is such a lineage and such a history of it being available to the public that it, he's hoping at least that it will be held, you know, upheld 
that they will, the public will be able to continue to use that road. So I, I think I, I'm sorry. Can I chime in on this? Sure, but um, so uh, there's a bunch of attorneys here who are attorneys in that case. Uh, we have David Bertoni and Ann Targosa in the audience who represent Cedar Island supporters. And then uh, I think Amy is now one of the new town attorneys. And uh, Pete and I uh, and a couple other <laughs> property owners. Yeah. Should we just bring the team here? here. Yeah. 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 Um, we represent the private property owners. I think one one thing that I can tell David's like chomping at the bit to mention. A little bit because I feel like there's a third piece to this puzzle that hasn't been presented. And there's there's the town. And we've heard from the town. Would you mind coming sure, to the mic? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm assuming you want to capture this. I just, got, I just went through a meat grinder of a trial on a public prescriptive easement, so um, could, you, could you reintroduce yeah. yourself briefly? Sure. My name is David Bertoni. I'm with Brandon and Isaacson, and we were retained by a large number of members of the public to determine and hopefully prevail in establishing a public prescriptive easement. And it may be down a road, but this case began as much more than that. It began, it began as a collective of road and, and beach and it, it shows some of the risks that I think need to be taken into account. One of which is the, the shorefront and the roads leading to the shorefront are being gobbled up. And they're being gobbled up at such an aggressive rate that the prices are going through the roof for this property, and for good reason. It's the, some of the most beautiful land in the world. And then the question becomes, how does a town of limited budget in a state where you'd have to tax mayors into basic bankruptcy to be able to compete on a price basis for this land. And when, while our case involved the road, I won't talk about the specifics of it, I think it's gonna go up on appeal, I, that, that's presumptively what happens in these cases. Um, it begins with a discussion about the town. What can the town do? I've done some research in other places and the towns kind of look at this and they say, do we have a budget? to pay a million bucks for lawyers to stand up for our citizens. At a time when taxpayers are increasingly, increasingly crushed both by the bad economy and, and increased taxes. And I'm not sure that the towns then have the ability to sort of stand up for themselves, especially when well-heeled folks come in who pay millions of dollars for this property and can litigate um, ad infinitum. Um, and so we have, a, we have a situation where I think you've got the town, which has its own presumptive interest, the landowners who come in, and, many, and the increasing trend is for people who aren't sort of steeped in main culture to come in, and then you have the citizens who may feel like the town is not adequately representing them. And so when we talk about settling these cases, the one thing I wanted to make clear, and there's a lot of, you know, I, I'm a big believer in settlement. But what it's boiling down to is the individual goodwill of the, of the landowners. And there was a time when most of the landowners were fishermen, they were Maine natives, they carried on a long tradition of sharing their property. We are now sort of at a place where it is a case-by-case, -case expensive, litigious effort to try to figure out what people's rights are. And I don't know that that's a, that's a feasible long-term way of dealing with this problem. I must tell you that um, it is something that traditionally people have been, been able to get along, but there's also an attitude from places that are not Maine of the notion that you can create a compound, you can close yourself off to the world, that when you buy something, you own it in a way that allows you to turn away an entire community. It's, it's, it's a cultural shift. And the question is whether the law can really catch up and help us to sort of intermediate that. But so that, I'm a big believer in, in settling these cases. The question is though, do you, can you really have consistently a bunch of willing people who are able to do that? Thank you. That, that, I think that's an important uh, perspective. It's, it's one more case that highlights uh, things that are going on throughout the state. I mentioned at a couple of these previous panel sessions that these cases represent a minority of the interactions between the public and private owners in the state of Maine. Most of the time there are no problems. These two interests um, coexist peacefully. But the increasing number of them 
um, indicates that there is this new pressure that is not being resolved in the way that historically it had been. Um, so I think there is no one model yet. We're seeing all these different approaches, so litigation is work. There are also two very different things taking place here. So, so main, as, as Mainers and, and, and as Americans, people, we, we have an identity that's tied to the water, to the ocean. We're, we're an ocean nation. Maine is an ocean state. Um, if you look at the flag, it's well represented on the flag of, of, of the state of Maine. But another American ideal is the, the ideal of private property. And those two things come to a head in these types of things. Um, so